Thank you, Ollie. So, um, it's, it's kind of an obvious thing to note that the player of a game exists in relation to the game as some kind of an active being. Right? Um, but beyond recognizing um, a sense of agency as being fundamental to the player's experience of engaging with the game world, what I wish to examine today is the idea of action as being um, constitutive of the player's in-game self. Right? What um, in some earlier work I've called the ludic subject, right? the subjective I in the game world that the player crystallizes through engaging with the game world. Um, for the sake of specificity, I shall limit my observations to games in which the player is embodied um, in the game world in the form of a single playable figure. Um, with regard to this um, category of, of games, uh, Runa, who I'm, I'm very happy to be on the same panel as, um, so he, he draws on Merleau-Ponty's argument that um, consciousness is in the first place not a matter of I think, but of I can, which already highlights the centrality of action or the capacity of action um, to Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology. So on this basis, uh, Runa argues that the affordances granted by the avatar in relation to the game world represents a, quote, different I can, um, a different articulation of the capacity to act, and there, hence a different consciousness. Um, just as an aside, I've recently been playing Super Mario Odyssey, and that's, you know, the game's capture mechanic, which allows you to, well, kind of inhabit different um, temporary avatars, let's say, plays very much with this sense of, ah, what can I do now? Now I'm a T-Rex. I can do all these new things. Um, in a similar vein, um, Maritama Tullakanya, who's sitting somewhere at the back there, yeah, um, argues that what she terms the gameplay situation, right, the subjective perceptual si situatedness towards the game world, is also intrinsically tied to action. It, quote, establishes the conditions of experience that provides the player with a preconceived understandings of the action they need to perform in order to play the game. Um, my own model of ludic subject positioning is an attempt to formalize the same idea of the perceptual standpoint the playable figure establishes for the player in relation to the game world. And one of the main ways this perceptual standpoint is defined is the set of capabilities for action the player is granted towards the game world, and relatedly the limitations upon the range of actions, so both the I can and the I cannot. Um, I want to consider now the enactment of the ludic subject. That is, so what happens uh, from this subjective perspective of game world experience when the player begins to engage with the game world through this ludic subject position. So given that it represents the perceptual situatedness of the player towards the game world, um, you know, an experiential standpoint that determines a particular mode of being in the game world, then this engagement with the game world can be understood literally as an enactment of the ludic subject, right? A concrete putting into action. So it's with an understanding of action um, that I would have to start this investigation. Um, in the analytic philosophy tradition, broadly speaking, a distinction is made between action and event in general. Right? And on one level, this distinction is made on the basis that an action is the result of an intention, whereas an event is the result of a cause. Um, an action is forward-looking. Right? As von Wright puts it, it calls not for causal, but for teleological explanation. Right? What is its end? Now, intention, as uh, for example, Elizabeth Anscombe writes, is itself a problematic term. Right? It can be used with at least three distinct senses. So first, as expression of intention for the future. Second, as intentional action, so whether or not an action is intentional. Um, and third, intention in acting. By this last formulation, stating the intention underlying an action becomes a means of describing that action. Um, Donald Davidson, for example, writes, if an agent does A with the intention of doing B, there is some description of A, which reveals the action as reasonable in the light of the reason the agent had in performing it. Um, in a perhaps shorter way, uh, Paul Ricoeur says, to say why an, what an action is, is to say why it is done. Um, of course, an intention um, is a mental or subjective phenomenon. Um, Anscombe writes, if we want to know a man's intention, it is into the contents of his mind and only into these. 
that we must inquire. Um, so by this understanding, right, the action is forming an intention, independently of the actual objective realization of a change in the world. Um, this leads us to a problem. So namely, how do we account for the point of encounter between the subjective origins of the intention and the objective status of an action as an external event in the world? Von Wright conceptualizes this by saying that action presents two aspects, right, an inner and an outer, with the former being the intentionality of the action, um, the intention or will behind its outer manifestations, and the latter being <coughs> some event in the world. He links these two aspects uh, of the action by means of a systemic logic. So, By his argument, um, an action has meaning for its agent within the context of a closed system that an, that an agent isolates from her environment, rendered in the form of a state space, such that an intentional action can be understood as a kind of interference um, with the system's autonomous operation. So an action bears the agent's intention um, to, to change the system from an initial state A to a final state C, which differs from the state B that the system would have achieved on its own. So Ricoeur argues right, so the agent sets the system in motion and you know, this setting things in motion constitutes interference so at the intersection between one of the agent's abilities and the resources of the system. Now, um, I think with the audience in this room, I don't need to spend too long pointing out how close this systemic approach to action is to a number of philosophical and ideological understandings of play and games. Um, I'll just you know, very briefly mention um, you know, housing as oft-quoted, misquoted um, description of the demarcated separateness of play. Eugen Fink's development of the notion of the play world as a self-contained sphere of meaning. Um, and also Salen and Zimmerman's by now commonly accepted understanding of games as systems. Even more specifically, um, Von Wright's argument bears very close affinities to Jesper Yule's characterization of games as state machines, right? with player input actualizing one branch of the game tree, right? this branching hierarchically organized network of possible game states. Um, but we're still left with the central question underpinning this double-sided understanding of action. right? How do we determine the, the point of articulation between the mental and the external um, dimensions of action? Now, Ricoeur argues that the key to this intersection is, you know, going back, Merleau-Ponty's discourse of the I can. In this context, that discourse offers an ontology of one's own body, which by its double allegiance to the order of physical bodies and to that of persons, the subjects, therefore lies at the point of articulation of the power to act which is ours and the course of things which belongs to the world order. Um, for Merleau-Ponty, this, uh, this dual nature is the essential character of the body. Right? As he puts it, um, our body is a being of two leaves, both a thing among things and the subjectivity that sees and touches them. So it is defined by its double belongingness to the order of the object and to the order of the subject which determines relations between those two orders. Right, um, he gives the fa his famous example of the right hand touching the left to illustrate this um, double-sided uh, subjective objective nature of the body. Um, so the I can is the intersection of these two sides. Right? Our subjectivity taking object objective form as the capacity to act in the world. Now, with respect to the ludic subject, this double-sidedness of the body is reflected in the double-sided phenomenological relation um, of the player to her playable figure, by which the figure is both a subjective standpoint for the player in relation to the game world and also an objective entity belonging ontologically to the game world. It is. Right, it's thanks to this double-sidedness that the player's intention to act takes this external material form of a change in the state of the game world. Um, there is one more thing to note about action and intention, namely that in Ricoeur's words, action needs to be ascribed to an agent. So he writes, ascription marks the reference of all the terms of the conceptual network of action to its pivotal point, who. 
the intentions we ascribe to someone on the basis of an interpretation of their actions are who that person is uh, for us. Of course, one's own intentions do not demand interpretation in the same way as the actions of others, um, given that they belong to the class of things one knows without observation, to quote, to quote Ricoeur. As he puts it, it's in doing that one knows that one is doing something, what one is doing, and why one is doing it. So what, what role does the ascription of intention play in the analysis of the self in action? For Hannah Arendt, action is distinguished from mere productive activity of work or labor, thanks to its, quote, inherent <coughs> tendency to disclose the agent together with the act. So action represents a self-disclosure on the part of the actor. It constitutes an answer to the question, who are you? This said disclosure is understood not as a conscious one, but as an uh, unavoidable revealing of one's essential character. Right? One discloses oneself without ever knowing himself or being able to calculate beforehand whom he reveals, in her words. So Ricoeur also highlights this revealing character of action, but diverges from our Arendt on this latter point. When considering all the possibilities for actions available in one's existential situation, Ricoeur argues that um, making up one's mind is cutting short the debate by making one of the options contemplated one's own. So the free decision to act, to be faced with the branching you know, multiplicity of possible actions, and then to choose one action and make it my own, um, comes to be understood as a self-ascription. Right? The performing of an intentional action, right, the aiming of myself in the direction of a change I wish to bring about in the world, is at the same time a conscious determination of who I am for recur. So, armed with this understanding of action and its relation to the subject, I'll now discuss the question of action as it aids in the constitution of the ludic subject and the ludic self. Now, before the taking of action itself, um, it is as a disposition towards action that the player, you know, as ludic subject, experiences her situatedness in the game world. Um, so Gordon, I don't think he's here right now, yeah, um, so I can quote him for you, highlights. So um, he argues that the player's relation to the game world is first and foremost a disposition and a readiness to act. Um, so here I move into an example to illustrate my argument. And I'm happy that Hayo spoke about looking glass games yesterday because that allows me to justify what was a pretty random example as of being motivated by looking glass games being, as he said, kind of an exploration of conceptualities of action. So during a game of Thieves the Dark Project, uh, so the player finds herself hiding in an unlit alcove with a view along the corridor. So she needs to traverse this corridor um, in order to arrive at a room containing an item she wants to steal. Two torches light the corridor, and a pair of guards patrol the far end. Now, concealed in this dark alcove, the player, as Garrett, is safe, but if she were to step out into the corridor, she would be immediately spotted. So, she might stand here for several minutes, and here we can think about, you know, talking yesterday about ludic waiting. Um, but she, you know, she might be observing the guard's patrol patterns. She might be looking at her map and trying to figure out a different way to get where she wants to get. Um, she might be looking through her inventory and figuring out if there's anything that can help her. Uh, so even though she's not actually performing any action, her being in the game world still has a very actively, um, intensely active disposition, very much tied to her embodiment as Garrett. So on the basis of the I can that she is as a, an embodied ludic subject, she is considering the web of, possibility, of possibilities of action that are her possibilities. Let's say the player decide, eventually decides to use some of her you know, limited stock of water arrows to put out the torches in the corridor, um, which would then allow herself, as Garrett, to proceed along the, cor the corridor unseen. Um, this is, this has the kind of gamma level turned way up because it's actually a very dark game. So it's not as ridiculous as it looks there. Um, so following von Wright's theory of action, right, we can put it this way. So 
the player perceives the system that constitutes the game world as being in a particular state A, the corridor is lit, um, and forms an intention to act in such a way as to bring about a different state B, or the corridor is unlit. She could, you know, just as easily have decided upon another one of her action possibilities, like maybe using one of her regular arrows to kill the guards. Um, so, you know, actuating a different branch of the possibility space, leading to a new state C, in which the corridor is still lit, but the guards are dead. Um, in all of this, I don't think there's any, ac um, any question that the player um, you know, ascribes the action that is taken to herself, not to Garrett as a character standing apart from her. It is she who has the internal consciousness of deliberating and of perceiving the possibilities as her possibilities. And it's she who ascribes to herself the, um, you know, the intention of putting out the water arrows and the decision not to kill the guards. You know, following Ricoeur's argument, the player is not only choosing one of the many possible world states resulting from her I can. At the same time, she is also determining her own selfhood. Uh, her, her own ludic self through its enactment. As soon as this action is taken, it becomes part of the set of actions she recognizes as constitutive of herself. So the decision to put out the torches rather than, you know, for example, just trying to dash down the corridor reckless, recklessly and seeing what happens might suggest a meticulous or a careful disposition. Um, you know, the decision to avoid killing the guards, even if this would eliminate certain risks, might have perhaps an ethical basis. Right? And I'm also here reminded of Michelle's talking about you know, playing Zelda as a vegan. Um, so again, the player would ascribe this to her own ludic subjectivity. So the taking of action, of this action, is inseparable from the ascription of the qualities, you know, I am someone who is meticulous, or I am someone who avoids killing, or I'm playing someone who avoids killing at least, to this ludic subject. Here, the meaning of the phrase enactment of the ludic subject becomes clear. So it's only through the player's engagement with the game world that the frame of the ludic subject position, um, you know, that a ludic subject comes to be determined. Not only as a you know, life story, but as the set of predicates about the subject, uh, subject's identity that can be extracted from that action-based life story. Um, so going back a bit, for both Arendt and recur. The importance of action is dissociated from its material end result. This is an approach to action that stresses the urge to self-disclosure at the expense of all other factors, in Arendt's words. Um, she draws on Aristotle to characterize action by this understanding as um, energeia, I hope I pronounced that right, which she understands as referring to the fact that the end, the telos, is not pursued but lies in the activity itself. Um, so though an action is invariably oriented towards um, affecting some change in the state of the world, its self-disclosing quality lies in the performance itself, not in the end result. Um, this is very close to an understanding of play such as Gadamer's, for example, right? He speaks of play as a living self-representation of the self-movement of living beings, which is the result of its quote, non-purposive character, right? Meaning that, again, it's not the achievement of the ends that are important, but the comportment the player adopts in striving towards those ends. But for the self-representation to occur, the player cannot just remain tied to the ludic subject position, right? Her own ludic subjectivity needs to be available to her as an object of perception, which can only be the case if she is able to somehow adopt a second distant per distanced perspective through which to frame a perception of her own ludic subjectivity. Again, you know, this is not a new insight. Fink, for example, spoke of the double existence of the player in two dimensions, yeah. um, which allows her to step out of her play role and to be aware of it as her role. And Gadamer also writes that in the act of play, I stand over against myself as an onlooker. And this experiential structure is very much re reflected in digital games. Um, elsewhere, I've argued that you know, the player simultaneously inhabits two standpoints, the game world internal perspective from which an in-game action is taken, what I've called the ludic subject position, 
and also um, an external perspective from which the game and the player's own actions within that are viewed um, from a distance standpoint. Um, so in her recent book, Marta complicates this further, arguing for a threefold, not twofold structure. Um, so by her understanding, the, the internal pers perspective is itself structured as an interplay between two situations. I, I already talked about the gameplay situation earlier, which is, I can take as roughly analogous to the duty subject position. And then the second um, internal standpoint, um, what she t refers to as the aesthetic situation, reflects over the in-game position of the self-avatar, who realizes their situatedness while perceiving the game world. Um, so we could, for example, attribute this standpoint to this standpoint the player's hesitation when a guard wanders into her sights in, in Thief, as she considers who she is in the game and whether she wants to kill the guard or not. Um, so this is again similar to how you know to how we perform actions in our life, right? We act on pre-reflectively on the basis of our I can, and we are also able to reflectively um, take a step back and contemplate our own actions. But what's different in the situation of digital games is that these two standpoints are themselves caught in the frame of an external perspective by which the game is viewed from the outside as a technological artifact. Um, so the player's in-game subjectivity, you know, both her in intentional actions um, and her reflexive recognition of her own um, ludic subjectivity through the ascriptions of, of these actions to her in-game self, itself does become the ele um, elements of the aesthetic unity of the game as an object. To summarize, I know I've gone slightly over time. So through acting upon the game world from the standpoint of the ludic subject position, the player therefore enacts a ludic self, right? that is disclosed through the self description of the actions she takes in the game, and emerges as the who that unites all of the player's actions. And what's then unique to the experiential structure of digital games is the way in which this enactment of self is itself framed um, within the structure of the game as an aesthetic object. And it's in this sense that the conditions of experience of digital gameplay allow for an aesthetic of subjectivity, right, with action as its foundation. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. We do have some time for questions. Any takers? There is one, Jaroslav, go ahead. Thanks so much for the talk. Uh, I have I have maybe two borderline examples, and I'd like to know what you think mm -hmm. about, about sure. those. So one of them is uh, uh, the possibility of the player disowning her previous actions mm -hmm. by kind of re reloading after saying, "Okay, so I did this, but this is not me. Mm -hmm. I'm going back." And the other one is um, I discussed it uh, um, with somebody like the the uh, for instance in puzzle games like Portal. Mm -hmm. Uh, there might be two kind of different approaches to solving the puzzles. One is just to solving it in your head, mm -hmm. so it's like mental, you know, process. Mm -hmm. And the other is just by trying it out in the game, and that would be then called probably action. And is there a difference for you between those, or or what what is the difference between those? So these are kind of the two borderline examples. And I'd, I'd love mm -hmm. to know what you think. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean, interesting examples. I think um, I've been largely speaking about what um, I suppose we can call a kind of idealized version, right? the, um, operating on the assumption that the player develops this level of identification with an in-game self, which isn't a simple identification of saying, you know, this is me, but, um, you know, this is kind of a project of selfhood which I want to play out in this game. And there are obviously different ways of relating to it. And I think you're raising good examples of that, right? I mean, I think we all recognize the kind of situation where I say, all right, I want to try this crazy thing. And then if it goes wrong, I'll just reload. And then that action, and that, that does represent the kind of disowning, right? Because then that represents the kind of refusal to ascribe that action to my in-game self. Right? All right, I want to see what happens if I beat this guy up. But no, that, I don't want this to be part of who I am in the game. So. I reload to cancel that action out, or or even perhaps I just you know kind of edit, you know, edit this out of you know oops I mean I did something wrong, um, I just kind of edit this out somehow of my perception of who I am in the game you know that never happened. Um, 
which in a sense isn't also that different to how we construct our selfhood. And Ricard does talk about the way in which we kind of, in our, you know, selfhood is a narrative which we actively construct, and that involves the emphasizing of certain actions and perhaps the kind of rejection of certain actions that we do take, but which we decide are not who we are. Right, yeah, I know I, you know, I know I did this bad thing, but that's not who I am. I just, you know, I might find a way of exonerating myself or justifying myself, or simply kind of, in a sense, pushing that out of my consciousness of myself. Um, and I think we can also ascribe the kind of trying things out <coughs> to that. The kind of, mm, what, what does this button do? Let me just try this um, scenario. Um, which I think is true in puzzle games and adventure games, right, which have that try everything with everything kind of uh, mechanism, which I think, in a sense, is more exploration of the system than any kind of conscious intentional action, you see what I mean? But yeah, um, you know, good, good, good examples to kind of complicate the, the standpoint I'm taking. Thanks. Could you turn off your mic, Yaroslav? <laughs> and there was uh, Stefano next. Hi, thank you for the beautiful presentation, very clear and well timed in my opinion, at least I could get everything you were talking about. Um, one question, you were talking about this um, Southwood project and Marta was talking about this sort of existential project and uh, if I'm not mistaken they are very similar to one another. I would like to ask you, in which way are they separated from our, let's say, actual selfhood, selfhood project, and in which ways they can communicate in your model. As in, like, if I do take an action, let's say Michelle is uh, vegan run as mm -hmm. an existential project within Breath of the Wild, how does that reflect on the external um, selfhood project, the one that you define as an external perspective of? Is the question sort of clear? Yeah, um, it's, a, uh, it's also a very good question. Um, it's. It's an intriguing question because um, if you so if you look at um, Ricoeur's understanding of the project of selfhood, right? He um, understands it in this very kind of hierarchical way. So, like at, at the kind of lowest level, we have ac all the actions that we take. At the highest level, we have a coherent self, and there are many levels in between, right? So, one of the levels in between is the kind of organization of sets of actions into practices by which we define ourselves, right? which are always the, re the relation between a system and a set of actions taken within that system. So he gives the example of farming, right? If I, um, if I identify, you know, a constitutive element of myself what is that I identify myself as a farmer, then that means that I engage in the practice of farming, which involves many kind of actions, right? Like, you know, sowing the crops, harvesting, you know, watering fees, you know, whatever it is that a farmer does. Um, I'm not a farmer. And, um, and one way of looking at how, um, you know, playing a game and taking on this kind of in-game selfhood relates to our wider project of selfhood is to perhaps understand it as one such practice within a wider selfhood. It's interesting that he does himself take the example of games as a practice um, in, in the book One Self as Another, which I've been quoting from. Um, so there is that kind of relation, I feel, between our you know, in-game um, you know, ludic subjectivity project and our general project of self And it's, it's not a one-to-one -one relation. Right? I can choose to play a self in the game in a particular game which I identify as being very different to my in-game self. And I frame this as, you know, an exploration of an alternative or something like that, right? Which goes very much against my own image of myself. So I think that it opens up the space where all kinds of um, interesting relations can happen, right? Relations of oppositions, relations of identification, um, through this kind of distanced external internal um, perspective. I know that answers the question. Yes, but so the fact that you played a farmer in a game makes it se makes you a farmer. That's you said you're not a farmer, so I was wondering whether hierarchically you don't consider that. Well, it doesn't. It, it doesn't make me a farmer right? because playing a farmer in the game is not the same as being a farmer, right? And um, partly because it is caught within this play frame. Um, 
it I mean it's it's a kind of it's a distant it's a distanced um aestheticized I suppose relation to a played subjectivity which is different to a kind of an actual an actual subjectivity which allows for different forms of exploration I feel and different um negotiations of relations between my in game self and my own self. Okay, and in the interest of time, this is where we shall stop. Thank you, Daniel.